The Bay Area of California has bred some phenomenal ball players throughout the years, and this is no surprise considering the region as well as the state's deep-seated history of basketball excellence. UCLA men's and women's basketball, Venice Beach, the Drew League, California is basketball. The Bay Area is basketball. And while names like Jason Kidd, Gary Payton, and Hook Mitchell immediately come to mind when you think of Bay Area basketball, there isn't quite a more polarizing yet obscure legend from the Bay Area like the Jumping Jack from Oakland named Isaiah Ryder. Nigga, I'm serious. I can't hear out my left headphones. Turn that shit up. Yeah, let that beat ride like that. That's right. Here I come. I'm going to drop it. Y'all ready? Oh, nigga, you got the beat up. Was born on March 12th in 1971 in nearby Alameda. Attending Encino High School, Ryder was a prep star and local media darling, being among one of the top ranked ball players in the state of California. However, surprisingly enough, Isaiah was only able to secure a JUCO scholarship coming out of high school, starting out his college campaign at Allen Community College in Iola, Kansas. He made the most out of his stay, though, averaging just over 30 points a game and securing a second scholarship to Antelope Valley Community College in Lancaster, California. He tore it up at AVCC as well, increasing his scoring average to 33 points per game and finally securing a spot with the story but controversial University of Nevada, Las Vegas. It seemed like JR, as he was nicknamed in his youth, was destined for UNLV, as his two years there were successful to say the least. In his debut season, Ryder led the running Rebels to a 26-2 record, going undefeated in conference play. UNLV finished with the number 7 ranking in the Associated Press, and Isaiah averaged just over 21 points per game within the top 20 in the country. Too bad nobody outside of the UNLV student and staff and whoever they were playing ever saw this season. Remember when I said UNLV was controversial? Well, a couple of seasons before Isaiah arrived, the Rebels got into a little situation involving the culmination of previous infractions. Too many damn infractions to recollect. Nonetheless, the NCAA Athletics Board suspended UNLV Athletics from national TV exposure and any participation in the NIT in exchange for UNLV being granted the opportunity to retain their Title I in 1990 and recruiting privileges. Yeah, bro. Controversial, and what's worse is that UNLV had been permitted access to the NIT the year that JR joined the team, and it's a good chance that UNLV would have knocked off the eventual NCAA champs that year, the University of Arkansas Razorbacks. The fourth forfeit from the NIT didn't stop the show for UNLV, fortunately, at least in the regular season. With the nation's eyes finally on Ryder, he rose to the occasion, averaging 29.1 points per game, which was second in the country behind University of Texas Port Arthur's Greg Guy. He also managed to secure Big West Player of the Year honors and a second team All-American spot. The Rebels finished 21-8 in the season, 13-5 in conference play, and they failed to secure a conference title, losing to conference rivals New Mexico State. Due to this conference blunder, the Rebels were not invited to the NCAA 64-team tournament, and they did, however, slide into the NIT, but keeping with the controversial pattern that you'll pick up on throughout this video, Ryder was suspended from the NIT on suspicion that he had a female student help him cheat on some of his college courses. The Rebels predictably shriveled, and they took a first round L to the USC Trojans. With JR's college career over, he immediately declared for the draft and was taken fifth overall by the Minnesota Timberwolves in 1993. He was an instant hit with the Wolves, averaging 16 points per game and almost four boards on 60 starts. His play earned him a spot on the all-rookie first team and according to some, he was poised to be a star. You see, JR's claim to fame since his prep days at Encino was one thing and essentially one thing only, unadulterated athleticism. I mean, Isaiah Ryder could fly. He was big and he was fast and he had tunnel vision like scoring tendencies. And in the NBA in the 90s, this was dangerous. His athleticism is what got him his nod for the NBA slam dunk contest his rookie year, the same contest he predicted he would unanimously win on draft night. They call it clairvoyance or luck, but not only did he win that night, he shut the house down with one dunk, the East Bay Funk dunk. Takes the ball between 
signature dunk that he made famous last year in the NCAA dunk contest. As he's moving the shot clock, the cameraman, and the Gatorade containers. <laughs> Isaiah is also an interior designer here at the Target Center. Here we go, Isaiah Ryder. Look at that one he wraps under his leg. Isaiah is 6'5". He's not happy with the uh, setup over there right in front of Scotty Pippen. Let's see if he asks Scotty Pippen to move. I doubt that. Scott and Pippen got three NBA championship rings. He can't ask him to move. Good point, <laughs> Charles. <laughs> oh, between his legs. How about it? Charles Barkley, what do you think? Oh, my God. That might be the best dunk I ever seen. That was awesome. Three solid years, averaging 19 points per game and three boards. However, these numbers were a byproduct of a good player on a bad team, and judging from the Wolves' consistently poor as record and Ryder's sketchy shooting numbers, it could be easily assessed that JR's play was slipping and his growing ego off the court wasn't helping his case within management. The Wolves read the writing on the wall, and in the 96 season, they dealt him to the Portland Trailblazers for Bill Curley, James Robinson, and a conditional first round pick for the 97 or 98 season. It seemed as if the change in scenery was beneficial for JR, as he led the Blazers in scoring for the 97-98 season with nearly 20 points per game, which was 15th in the league standings at that time. He was also 8th in the league at 3-pointers made with 135, and 8th in 3-pointers attempted at 420. This was also the season where Ryder exploded for a career-high 38 points on 15 for 25 field goal shooting, along with five boards and four assists against the Raptors on February 1st, 1998. However, Ryder was still a chucker and a bit of a locker room nuisance, so in his two years with Portland, they never made the playoffs. In his final year in Portland, JR averaged 13.9 points per game and 2.3 assists per game. While he led the scoring sheet 13 times this season, his play was wildly inconsistent and he received a lot of DMPs from all the court infractions. It's around this time that Ryder's career took a bit of a nosedive, to say the least. Now let's touch back on the word controversial. JR's move to Atlanta, very controversial. For starters, while he was still seen as an explosive scorer when he was feeling it, he was nowhere near on the level as the other side of the trade. Who was that, you might ask? Oh, I don't know, just residential sharpshooter and NBA All-Star Steve Smith. The fans and coach Lenny Wilkins himself wanted no parts of the four-way trade, but management insisted deeming JR to be the final piece to the fourth place Atlanta Hawks. Coach Wilkins did his best to fit Ryder in the system, and Ryder again seemed to rise to the occasion, rounding out at 19 points per game over 60 games. However, his stats were a little superficial. His shooting percentages were slipping by this point, and a diminished athleticism mean he had to rely on other facets of his game, facets he just simply didn't work on. Let me just throw a few stats and percentages at you. 31% from three-point range, 45% overall field goal percentage, and 79% from the free throw line, and 2.8 turnovers per game. These were easily JR's worst numbers in his career and combined with Atlanta's instant slippage into suckage in the 99-2000 season, it seemed like a sign of his role on teams to come. His next stop was Tinseltown, Los Angeles Lakers. At 29 years old, with a stock reputation for being a head case and injury prone, he was immediately relegated to the bench where he was placed in a more six-man light role. He flourished somewhat, leading the bench in scoring at 7.6 points per game over 18 minutes. He played a healthy 60 games, but Coach Phil Jackson decided to keep him on DMP for the playoffs in favor of Devin George and Greg Foster. Nevertheless, when the Lakers won the championship, they decided to give him a ring anyway. Judging by the fact that JR wanted to come back to the Lakers the following season, it's pretty safe to say LA was a perfect fit for him. But basketball is a business, and what's the point in paying a guy six-man money during the regular season when he's DMP all playoff season? So the Lakers shipped JR to his last team, the Denver Nuggets. He played 10 games, averaged seven minutes, and three points a game. And his time spent there was bizarre because he never formally retired. In his own words, I can still play. With career totals of 16.7 points per game, 3.8 rebounds per game, 
and 2.7 assists per game on an average of 31 minutes, it's safe to say that Isaiah was a decent NBA player. But the way his career began is looked as though the shooting guard position was getting some more heat. However, nagging injuries, clashes with coaches and players, and substance abuse issues played major parts in his departure from the league, the latter of which seemed to haunt him years later. In 2007, Isaiah was sentenced to seven months in county jail for cocaine possession, evading police, and battery, but he ended up serving half of his sentence getting released on good behavior. In an interview with Yahoo Sports, Ryder told a reporter, my mother was dealing with severe heart disease, so my mind was scattered. This seemed to hold true as Isaiah was arrested for several more substance-related and disorderly conduct charges between 2007 and 2012. Thankfully, none of them seemed to stick, and by 2013, JR had begun his road to redemption. In 2014, Isaiah was invited to speak at the Basketball Hall of Fame as a part of their 60 Days of Summer series. Talking to a group of about 100 people and an interviewer, Isaiah lamented and reminisced over past accolades and transgressions, from winning the dunk contest, his most cherished moment, to losing his mother, his lowest point in 2007. Tears began pouring down his face, he says. She was 46. She was my world. And just like that, Isaiah reached a breakthrough, and he's remained on the straight and narrow ever since. Isaiah today still looks fit. Isaiah today still can dunk. But above all the things that remain the same, Isaiah's character changed. No longer is he the slacker phenom from Oakland who could have been one of the best we've seen, but a grounded man more concerned with rectifying past mistakes and helping the future generation achieve excellence. Whether it's a charity event or just a camp for the local kids, Isaiah's going to be there. I'll end this video with a quote from Ryder himself from 60 Days of Summer. You know, I still try to do things where I can. I give scholarships to kids in the city, to hospitals and kids overseas in Trinidad and Africa. Charity work is very important in my life. My mom worked with special ed kids when I was young, so that lesson was instilled in me at an early age. Hmm. Seems like fallen stars can be the light of the earth. All the big dogs know that my man fist the cup rules the streets. <laughs>